Welcome everyone. We're going to be doing chapter eight, nationalist and economic development of the Jeffersonian era. So we're going to be focusing basically on the economic development of this new country from 1800 through the 1820s into the 1830s, even a little bit. We're going to be focusing on Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and Adams and their presidencies during this time period. But again, this time period will push into uh, the Jacksonian era as well, economically speaking. Um, in this time period, America really goes from being a country with very little economic development early on, all the way to basically our, through our first market or industrial revolution, uh, which encompasses our first textile industries and our first major transportation improvements, including canals and railroads. With that, we will also see an influx of new Americans. Uh, basically immigrants coming from new countries that are going to flood into America, increasing our population and change our political structure as well. So there's a lot of key developments going on here. So let's get right into it right away. Okay, so after the War of 1812, we see our economy getting very different. Uh, this war really sets us apart. It allows America to start becoming its own independent economic nation. Um, one part that helped speed that along is going to actually be the charter of the second national bank. Uh, remember that the first bank was very uh, debated and eventually it will be killed by Jeffersonians, including James Madison. Um, eventually, though, Madison will charter a new bank when the first charter's bank runs out. So after the War of 1812, we're going to see the second bank rechartered, and that's going to carry America economically during this time period, allowing it to you know, draft loans and um, deal with uh, the expansion of America's commerce. That's going to be a really major issue going, going forward with that. It's also going to help stabilize smaller banks and keep them in check in regards to the amount of loans and currency that they carry. Okay, one big part of American economic expansion is our territorial expansion, something that was really pushed by the Jeffersonians. Uh, Jefferson basically created a huge amount of new land available in the Louisiana Purchase. And that land was not going to be really occupied by white Americans early on. But what that land expansion really did, it did allow us to systematically move Native Americans westward, which will allow the rapid expansion of Americans in that Ohio River Valley and also into the southern states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. So we're going to see a flood of new Americans flood westward across the Appalachian Mountains. We're going to see um, brand new states come to the Union. We're going to see basically Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee. We're going to see the southern states of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. And also we're going to see Missouri, which is going to be a very controversial state as, as we'll see. With that population growth and expansion, will also come lots of big thematic things. We're going to see large uh, immigration increases. We're going to see large amount of slavery and cotton increases because of the cotton gin. We're also going to see transportation really, really expand during this era, uh, from just roads and the use of rivers prior to this area to the use of canals and railroads by the end of this era. So a huge sort of increase of development and importance on new transportations to flood this area with people and products. And so that's going to be a big part of this. We're going to see um, the protective tariff of 1816 really focused on protecting these new Burgoyne industries after the War of 1812. Uh, we're going to see those protective tariffs continue throughout the Jeffersonian era and into the Jacksonian era, uh, really favoring the North over the South economically. We're going to see transportation focusing on the northern states and the western states, really favoring them over transportation in the South. So we're really seeing an expansion of northern ideals, which is going to really sort of separate the country as well. So we're going to see a lot of what America is doing sort of help give rise to increased sexualism as well during this time period. Okay, some of the things that sort of got our industry going and flourishing. Obviously, America needed help. So we imported a lot of technology from England. A lot of it was snuck in illegally, basically us basically sending spies to England to take 
uh, schematic drawings of their machines, uh, basically offering a huge amount of money for engineers and machinists to come over and immigrate to America. And England did everything in its attempt to try to stop that from happening. Um, again, they could only do it limitedly. One big important figure this time period was Eli Whitney. Uh, basically, he was an inventor, he was an entrepreneur, and he really did a couple things to really expand industry. One, one thing that everyone knows, cotton gin, of course. That is a really staple thing. It not only helps uh, allow for more cotton to be in production, but they had a lot of systematic effects that really, really, really sort of drastically changed America as well. Because now cotton could be then separated from its seed really easily, it allowed for new, hardier strains of cotton to go into uh, production, basically going to cultivation that would never have been viable before, which then basically made more land available to cotton, which basically said, hey, let's plant more cotton. Well, that's going to have a, a very adverse effect of renewing this whole need for slave labor. And so that's one huge effect of the cotton gin is this whole need for more plantations, which will cause more demand for slavery, but it will also cause a newer demand for textile industries to start rising up in New England. So without cotton gin, we don't see the rise of new cotton strains. We don't see the rise of new slavery and new sl the slave institution getting sort of a, a reboot. We also see this really helping the North. So even the, the, the North doesn't directly have slaves themselves for the most part. I mean, they have slaves, but not in a systematic, large-scale way like the South does. But we see them directly relying on the slave labor system that's built up on the cotton plantations of the, of the South. So even though it does divide the North and South to, uh, basically apart, it does connect them in some strange, peculiar institutions as well. Also what Eli Whitney was for is the interchangeable parts, basically machine parts, parts that can be made by a machine and can be replicated over and over again to the exact T. So this was really, really, really important for our industries to start mass producing goods, especially weapons. This was really vital for us to start winning wars, for us to not rely on small scale gunsmiths or weapons from Europe to help us uh, you know, create an army, a navy, and other things that could be um, self-serving for us both foreign policy-wise and domestically. Okay, transportation was key to this time period, obviously. Um, one, obviously with shipbuilding and across the seas ocean, we can now spread our goods to the foreign markets of Europe. But even more important, most of our new markets were going to come from within. Uh, the most new markets was going to come at home, but by getting those markets in to the hands of Americans. So the way to do that is spread transportation to the inner parts of our country. One obvious way was steamships. Basically, you can always go down the river, but to get goods back up the river took power. So Robert Fulton, which you should write down, was a creator of that steam engine for the steamships. Uh, the first really paddle wheel steamship to artificially paddle this steamship to go up the Mississippi to now spread goods into the Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi Valley, Missouri Valley as well, which will then f fuel the expansion of those states or those territories into states. Of course, we're going to have turnpikes, we're going to have roads. Those are going to be continually developed to go across and over the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, again, the, the slower, you can't do as much travel, but it does link those two areas together because you could have posts, you could have uh, travel between states and over the Appalachian Mountains much more easily with these national roads. But the biggest and most drastic improvement in transportation was canals. Uh, these canals uh, were built across the Northwest, and, which is, was like the you know, Midwest today, and the Northeast. Uh, the most famous one was linking the Hudson River Valley to Lake Erie, called the Erie Canal. And this really, really linked these two areas together, the Northwest and the Northeast, making New York really the commercial hub of the East Coast, and that's setting the stage there. Canals will be short-lived, though. You see, they're really going to start going out of favor by the 1840s in, basically, because they can't be put everywhere. You have to have rivers and lakes for them to connect to. And so what really is going to be the, the thing that overtakes them eventually by the 1850s is railroads, which we'll talk about in later lectures. 
And of course, as we become more industrialized, we are going to see more rising urban areas or cities. You have to remember, though, however, most of Americans still resided in the countryside. Most Americans still farmed, but America was slowly becoming more urban on a very small scale, especially in those large East Coast cities of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, to name a couple. And of course, we're going to go far west also. We are going to have some explorers who start exploring and setting footholds in the Rocky Mountains in the far west uh, as fur trappers. Um, and uh, um, John Astor was one of the really famous ones because of that. We also see immigration rise. We're going to see uh, America flood immigrants or immigrants flood into America in the 1840s and 1850s, especially from two areas, Ireland and Germany. And these people are going to flood into the north. Uh, north. Most of the Irish coming with very little money were going to take factory jobs in the northeast, like Boston and Philadelphia and New York. And most of the Germans wanting land are going to flood into the northwest, like Iowa and Wisconsin and, and Illinois and places like that. Um, most are going to vote Democrat for the most part. And so it's going to uh, sort of uh, rise up a new voting class of Democrats within the northern part of this country. Also that comes with this is a rise of nativism, a rise of anti-immigrant feelings. So we're going to start seeing our first real anti-immigrant legislation and anti-immigrant groups coming up to sort of basically push back the influx of non-American or non-English ideals in America. So this whole idea of like, of, um, uh, anti-immigrant ideology is not brand new. This is something that has stemmed from years and years and years past. And we call this time period the time period after Jefferson, the era of good feelings. We call that because what happens when Moreau gets elected in 1816, he's going to go on a goodwill tour. He's going to basically go on a goodwill tour across the country, really try to link the country together to bring a, together the Federalists into the Democratic Republican Party. However, though, by the time this happens, because of the Hartford Convention and because of the slow dis, uh, dismantling of the Federalist Party, we're going to see the Federalist Party actually completely dismantle after the 1860 election altogether. So this will be the last election the Federalists will run a national candidate. By 1820, they are going to cease to exist and we'll have one party altogether. The Democratic Republicans will be a universal party across America. When Monroe comes to office, he will, uh, him and Adams will also start pushing a very nationalistic um, sort of economic system. Uh, very closely, you could say, related to Hamilton in ideology. Henry Clay, a um, uh, representative from Kentucky, is going to come up with his American system. And he's going to have three parts to that. First part is going to protect uh, protected tariffs, large taxes on foreign goods. The second part is to uh, basically federally fund internal improvements, meaning federally fund canals and roads to link these two northern areas together, the northwest and northeast, and also as very strong support of the Bank of the United States. Those three aspects are going to be really important for this American system. Not all aspects are going to be good and dandy, though. Uh, we are going to have some panics. Um, in this time period, we have our really first economic panic is the Panic of 1819. Um, and that really was stemming from the huge amount of farm goods that were really uh, going crazy high prices-wise during the Neapolitan Nepal Wars. Um, after those wars end, we're going to see a crash of farm prices. Um, we're going to see a huge amount of land crash because of the expansion or over-expansion of uh, farmers' land. We also see the new national bank tightening credit, causing many of the smaller banks to stop uh, stop their flow of credit. Uh, and so people are going to start to really sort of down the national bank a little bit and start looking at that as maybe something that's not beneficial for the good of the whole country. Also, we're going to have our first real major sectional crisis during this time period. And that's going to be based off of new states coming to the existence and how do we pin them? Do we pin them as a slave state or a free state? Uh, the problem is, is that during this time period, we had an even amount of slave and free states, which meant we had an even amount of senators that were voting pro-slavery and anti-slavery. Um, we also started seeing a very big divide between northern and southern states when it comes to economy, religion, and also education. 
And what happens is that Missouri wants to come to the Union in 1820 or 1819, actually, as a slave state, which would upset the balance of slave states over free states. It was 11 long before this. And what happens, though, the, the statehood always starts in the House of Representatives. So early on, basically, a representative from New York, Talmadge, basically passes the Talmadge Amendment that bans Missouri from becoming a state. He says, we don't want another slave state into the Union. Uh, it would upset the balance. Well, later that year, Maine tries to become a free state. It actually passes the House, but the Southern senators block it. So now there's a huge controversy. What do we do in regards to bringing in new states into existence? So Henry Clay, the great compromiser, comes up with this Missouri Compromise. In this Missouri Compromise, we see Maine coming in the Union as a free state, Missouri coming in the Union as a slave state, and then a new line of demarcation coming into existence called the 3630 line. This line will be set up, and everything below this line is going to become a slave state. Everything above this line will be a free state. And so we have this line now, right there in America, that now marks what's going to be slave and what's going to be free going forward from this point in time. And if you look, think about it, you think it's, oh, it's, that's a fair system for the, the, the free states and the slave states. But if you look at the territory that was already claimed by America, a huge amount of it was above this line, and only a very small amount of it was below the line. So this actually was a huge win for free states comparatively because the amount of territory that was above this demarcation line. And the famous quote by Jefferson was that um, basically this is a momentous question like a fire bell in the night that awakened and filled me with terror. So he was really worried that this was going to basically be the death blow to the American uh, Republic was this issue over slavery. Okay, the Marshall Court uh, is a really important court that really makes some landmark decisions that go for that set precedent for years to come. We're going to go through this sort of quickly. Uh, we've already talked about Marbury vs. Madison and the whole aspect of judicial review. A couple other landmark cases was the Cold vs. Maryland, and this was contesting the Bank of the United States. Basically, Maryland tried to basically make this bank uh, go out of existence by suing them or basically charging a tax on them, a huge tax of $10,000 on banknotes. So, okay, so the bank declared this act unconstitutional and sued Maryland for this case. Okay, John Marshall ruled that this bank was necessary and proper using that elastic clause, implied powers, and said that you can't tax the bank. The power to tax is the power to destroy. And what that meant was basically the decision gave the bank and implied powers credibility. It also established national supremacy or federal supremacy over state supremacy. So very landmark case in that. A second case was Gibbon versus Ogden. Uh, this was basically a case where we basically had New York who gave a monopoly to a steamboat captain. That steamboat you know, company then will basically have that monopoly. Well, a second steamboat ferry will start operating on that Hudson River, okay? And so we're going to see that basically Ogden, who had the monopoly, is going to sue Gibbons, okay? So Ogden is going to sue Gibbons and in a state court and is going to win. Then Gibbons is going to appeal this case in the national court. I, I, we'll go over this in class as well, because this is sort of a tricky concept. And so Mar uh, Marshall will rule that basically the monopoly granted to Ogden was unconstitutional, giving Gibbons the victory here. And what that states is that the, only the federal government, and here's the big thing, only the federal government has a power to regulate interstate commerce. And that's a big one. That the government trade between states is given to the federal government, not the states themselves. Okay, last one. Dartmouth College and Woodward and Fletcher versus Peck are very similar on this because they both deal with contracts. Basically, Dartmouth College was given a private school contract way long time ago. A brand new government in New Hampshire declared that, 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 that Dartmouth College has to be public. So Dartmouth College sues and loses in the state of New Hampshire. They appeal it 
and now goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules that Dartmouth College can stay a private institution because they had a contract. So basically what that does, it gives legal bindingness to contracts. And it says that the, the Supreme Court can overturn state court's decisions. And Fletcher versus Peck is very similar. We basically had a land contract. The, law, the, the Yazoo Land Company was given a huge amount of land, a land grant. The newly elected legislator in Georgia revoked that contract. And basically, so the Yazoo Company Fletcher will sue Peck in the state of Georgia. They'll lose, they'll appeal it, and now they'll go to the state or the Supreme Court. Marshall will rule that the new legislator had no right to revoke Yazoo's land grant. Therefore, basically saying contracts cannot be overturned and federal courts can overturn state courts' rulings. And again, we'll go over those in class as well. Okay, some foreign policy under this Monroe Doctrine, this, this Monroe presidency. Uh, we see Florida becoming a U.S. territory called in the Adams Honest Treaty. Uh, we see basically John Quincy Adams broker an agreement with the uh, uh, Spanish ambassador. And basically America takes Florida and gives up claims to Texas. So we take the state of Florida, the territory of Florida, and we give up our claim to Texas. That was as a trade-off right there. So it gives America this new land, and we give up these claims to this land in Texas right there, which, which we'll eventually get when we go to war against Mexico. So big win for America there. The Rush Baggage Treaty basically de-arms the Great Lakes because you have British Canada up here, you have America down here, and you have all these naval facilities on the Great Lakes. And what that does is basically say, hey, we're, we're going to disarm that. We don't want another war. We're going to disarm. Also, we're going to give this little area of the Louisiana Purchase right up here. It should be a bubble up there to Canada. And then we're going to take this little piece of Minnesota, North Dakota as America. And America eventually will draw a line all the way to the Pacific Ocean to make the border between America and Canada in this treaty in the 49th parallel. But the biggest foreign policy of this time period was called the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was basically an extension of these brand new republics starting to get their independence from the Spanish Empire. And America was actually the one of the only countries that recognized these new republics' governments. But we were worried that, that European countries would come in and start influencing these newly developed uh, free countries and start threatening American sovereignty in the Western, developed, Western Hemisphere. So you have all these countries that are now developing brand new governments. And we wanted them to stay free because they were weak and we could control them. We didn't want other European powers like England or France or uh, Dutch to come in and take over these areas. So what we state in the Monroe Doctrine is that European, European, you know, basically the U.S. will recognize all European colonies that are already in the West. So any colony that's already there, like Cuba, or these little areas right there, are still going to be European colonies. We'll recognize that Europe has the right to their own colonies. We also agree to stay out of European affairs, so we will not touch anything in the Eastern Hemisphere. But what we do demand is that America becomes a protectorate of Western democracy, that basically we will not allow any European powers coming into the West and meddling with Western affairs. That means nothing. The key is though, we have no ability to back that up. We have none, no ability to back that up whatsoever. Um, and we don't really have to until the late 1800s. Um, but this starts to put America onto the national foreign stage. And so this is sort of, we sort of put a big border around the Western Hemisphere. America's going to control this. And as you see, the election of 1820, basically we see the fall of the Federalist Party in this election. And uh, we see Monroe basically running unopposed, really putting in the, the air of good feeling this time period. Okay, uh, that is basically this time period in a nutshell. It's a quick little lecture. Uh, we're going to have a lecture quiz on this tomorrow. And I hope this all makes sense. We will go over a lot of these things. I know we all went over them fast today. We will go over, especially the Marshall Court, in class on Friday. Okay, you guys have a great night, and we'll see you all in class. Bye, all.